Yes, uh, great that you joined this session. And thank you for your interest in financial inclusion. It works for women. I'm Florian Bernd from GIZ's financial systems development team. I'm very happy to, be, to moderate this session with five wonderful panelists. Mary Ellen Iskandarian, Women's World Banking, Catherine Pulvermacher, Microinsurance Network, Karen Ronan, uh, from Cosa Foundation, Barbara Magnoni, EA Consultants, and Evelina Angole, Grameen Foundation. I will present them uh, in more detail in a short while. Um, to give you an overview of what you can expect from the next uh, 90 minutes, there will be a quick introduction by Sam Mendelssohn from EMFP to the award publication. Then we will have some key messages of the panelists, what is important, very important for them regarding women's financial inclusion. And then we will have a moderated discussion. And in the last part, it's, it's your turn to ask your questions. And you can already also start um, asking your questions in the virtual space if you're joining us online. So Sam, please, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this plenary session that kicks off uh, day two of European Microfinance Week. My name is Sam Mendelssohn. I'm Financial Inclusion Specialist at the European Microfinance Platform. <clears throat> and I'm going to open this plenary, which itself kicks off the Financial Inclusion for Women stream at the conference, to speak for a couple of minutes about the annual EMFP publication that presents the landscape of each year's award, profiles the 10 semi-finalists, and among them the three finalists you're going to hear about at the ceremony tonight, and pulls together some of the factors for success that underpins these uh, exceptional organizations. The publication, uh, which is here, and uh, there's the cover. We're launching today in English. Uh, Spanish and French versions will follow very soon. It shares the name of the award, Financial Inclusion That Works for Women, downloadable as a PDF on the EMFP site, and uh, you can find hard copies around the Abbey. The award publication is the culmination of a long award process, uh, the climax of which is tonight with the announcement of the winner, but much comes before that and indeed after it. <clears throat> I'm the lead author of the paper, uh, have been for eight years now, but it's not just self-effacement to say it really is a team effort, not just my colleagues at EMFP here in the room who provide invaluable support, but also we depend on uh, the support of so many people through the year. The consultants we use this year was Chiara Pescatori, Michael Guarnieri, and Sally Yacoub, countless experts in gender mainstreaming, women's financial inclusion, who gave their time generously throughout the year to uh, it was particularly in the first few months when we had to begin mapping out the landscape of this topic to work out what this award would look like. Um, and that takes it from a blank piece of paper through supporting materials, mapping, designing two different application forms, evaluation grids, and the various communication materials and information events that support it. The publication is made up of several parts. It begins with a tour of the topic landscape, a brief history of microfinance for women, the supply and demand side barriers that women face, why financial inclusion for women matters, and the role that financial service providers can play from gender mainstreaming within the institution, the products and services life cycle and development of non-financial services. The next section talks about the process, the objectives of the award, rationale, criteria, selection, evaluation process, and then moves to the central part, the meat of the paper, which is the 10 profiles of the award semi-finalists, which started with an enormous record list of 88 this year and worked their way down to 10 and then to three. We frame these, these profiles within a number of broad approaches in the paper as each year. And along that line, this year we identify three main approaches. First, meeting women's needs through financial products and services. Two, mainstreaming gender equity and leadership within the institution and three, empowering women with non-financial services. Each of these profiles, several of the semi-finalists, and illustrates the elements of their strategies or that embody them. Finally, the paper concludes with factors for success in which we extract some common best practice among a very diverse range of organizations and initiatives. 
Uh, we hope it provides a valuable addition to the subject, shining a spotlight on what FSPs can do to put action to words and go beyond what we describe in the paper as a lazy conflation of outreach with impact, of access with value. Um, so please pick up a hard copy or a soft copy. Keep an eye out for the Spanish and French versions. Please disseminate them to your networks. And with that, I'm delighted to hand over to one of the most impressive lineups I think we've ever had at an EMW uh, for this plenary moderated by Florian. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sam. So we'll, we will start with a tour of some um, key statements. And uh, Mary Ellen Iskandarian is first. She's president and CEO of Women's World Banking. Her many commitments include being a committee member of two impact investment funds and being a member of the UN's Business and Sustainable Development Commission. She was working with ISC, Lehman Brothers, and is the well-known author of the book, There is Nothing Micro About a Billion Women Making Finance Work for Women. So, Mary Ellen, what are key pillars from your perspective to make financial inclusion work for women? Florian, thank you so much for such a generous introduction. Um, you know, I, I am very eager to, to look at the report because I, I heard Sam mention that um, you did look at some of the barriers. And when Women's World Banking embarked on its most recent strategy where we made a commitment to reach 100 million women by 2027 with a financial product or service that they did not previously have access to, we looked at the barriers across um, the major markets that we were um, hoping to work in. And we were you know, really surprised to find how similar they were. But when we look at the barriers that, that financial service providers kept telling us about, they just didn't think there was a business case there. And so I, I which is, is enormously frustrating, and many of you in this room are probably well aware that there is a, a, a very strong business case. But I think it points directly to my first pillar, which is the need not just to collect data and gender disaggregated data, which has been a policy recommendation for, I don't know, nearly a decade now, but then when you've collected it, to use it to make business decisions. We see far too often that financial service providers may actually, particularly those who are you know, in this age of big data, fintechs and others that are relying heavily on credit scoring, credit algorithms to make business decisions, they're just not really utilizing data to the, to the full extent that could be possible to drive decisions about products and services that women use, how they use them differently than men, where they may be using them, where there may be gaps. You know, I always love to, to um, refer to the central bank that's been the, the longest in collecting gender disaggregated data, data the, the banking superintendent of, of Chile, and in discovering not only collecting the data, but really using it, they were able to drive some really important product recommendations around savings products, housing loans, a whole range of different product opportunities because they had that, that data. And then I think very closely um, tied to that is my, my second pillar, which is making sure that you then use that data to develop products and services that are women-centered, that respond directly to needs and desires and pain points that women may, um, may, may encounter. We know that the level of inactive accounts is much higher for, for women, fully a third higher than for men. Um, so making sure that a product is directly relevant to a woman's experience. And I'll tell you, I'm, I am, speaking of data, I am quite concerned. I think we all did a real victory lap and a celebration dance uh, in June when we saw the Findex numbers finally bringing that impossible to budge 9% gender gap down to 6%. But the number that didn't get looked at quite as, uh, with quite, quite as much scrutiny, but that I, I find quite worrying, is that, as we know, I India represents a very, uh, you know, very large amount of the data that gets put into the Findex. It is not a weighted index. And in India, we saw a very significant portion of the Indian gender gap closed not by new account openings by women, 
but by account closings by men because they were no longer finding that, having that account relevant to their, their financial lives. And what I worry about if we know that the dormancy rate is higher among women to start with, that if we don't design products that are directly relevant to their lives, that we're not going to be able to keep them um, in the financial system. And then I think the, the last pillar, and this is something that many people in this room have been uh, real pioneers in, but is this idea of digital financial skills and uh, um, uh, uh, digital and financial skills and capabilities being absolutely essential. We know that women are not as comfortable navigating the technology that is the, the gateway to financial services. So being able to embed the capabilities in every product offering and everything that, that is delivered is going to be essential, again, to not just including women, but keeping women in the formal financial system. Thank you, Marianne. So it's use data, apply gender-centered design, and enhance skills and capabilities. I want to turn to Karen Ronan, who is executive director of Foncose Foundation, the award winner of last year's um, European Microfinance Award. She, as a medical doctor, Karen practiced medicine in Rwanda for six years. Then she completed her master in public health and left for Haiti in 1995. As the executive director of Foncose Foundation since 2009, she helped scaling the graduation program and developing the health micro-franchise. So how do you capture women's needs and aspirations at Foncose? Thank you for the introduction. Um, I think data is important, of course, the way you say it. And we do the, the regular satisfaction surveys and we look at the socioeconomic levels of the women we work with too. Because of course, as everybody knows, all women are not equal. And actually in Haiti, women who are well off, well educated, hardly have any barriers to financial inclusion. Whereas access to accounts is almost impossible for poor rural women in, in isolated areas. So it's important to disaggregate by gender. It's also important to look within the group of women the different socioeconomic levels you've got. The other thing is that data is nice, but there's a, an insight that you only get from qualitative data that you don't necessarily get from numbers. And so it's important to build in systems where you actually either do focus groups or you do key interviews, or like we have in Foncose, we have some clients who are actually members of our board. And so you build these more qualitative influxes of, of information that can give you insights in the how and why instead of just the what. One of the things we did a couple of years ago is we did a competition amongst the field staff. And they were, it, they were going to win a prize for the most significant story of a client. Because I think in the end what we really want is frontline staff that listen to clients and that bring to the leadership the really key insights and the, the significant stories they gather while doing their work. So that is really the whole organization that listens to the clients. Not just data, but also really trying to understand in depth. Thank you. So data is important and, and, and listen to your clients. Catherine, um, Catherine Pulvermacher is the executive director of the Microinsurance Network. She is a development economist specialized in Africa. Catherine has a background in investment banking, research and strategy consulting, and brings previous experience in managing member-based organizations. And Catherine, when women's financial union usually focus on savings, payments, loan, and their respective <coughs> service providers. So what is the situation um, regarding insurance when it comes to women's financial inclusion? Yes, well, uh, the situation from regarding insurance is, uh, is not much different, okay? So um, what is different is that for insurance, there's no global Findex to help us track how many women are using insurance. Um, but what we do know is that 
uh, at least based on estimates uh, covering the United States, uh, Europe, um, and, and developed Asia, um, as, and taking into account labor market participation and women-owned businesses. Um, we know that the Swiss Ray Institute is estimating that by 2029, a more inclusive approach that takes women's insurance um, and risk needs into account, so more customer-centric, more thoughtful, would actually represent more than $2 trillion um, of insurance premiums a year. So this is not an inconsequential market, even without taking the, the sort of humanitarian or um, moral high ground, if you like. Um, it's, it's absolutely bewildering why more attention hasn't been paid to, to our half of, of the world's population. Now, what is also true that we do know is that, um, because we, we carry out also primary research every year in, in uh, about three dozen countries, um, we know that uh, many insurers are not tracking key characteristics of their clients, So, um, and particularly just the, the very basic category of how many of your policyholders are women. Uh, or how many of the beneficiaries are women or girls. This is not routinely being tracked. In most cases where it is being tracked, it's because their immediate customer is a microfinance institution that only services women, and so they can extrapolate from that. So I think there's an absolute um, critical need to be more customer-centric in insurance, in pensions, in savings, and, um, and in credit, um, and to go beyond beyond this kind of basic data gathering to, to listen and to actually segment into customer segments to take a leaf out of the FMCG sector's book. They've been doing this for more than 20 years. They see it as the investment that is needed on an annual and ongoing basis to understand the evolution in their customer base and meet their needs. Um, it's been tremendously successful for companies like Coca-Cola. So why does it take up financial services so long to catch up, right? Um, now, despite the need for customer segmentation, um, <clears throat> I think there are some general trends. So women are more likely to work in the informal and informal sectors, informal and semi-formal sectors. That makes them harder to reach. Um, and that also means in many, many countries that they're far less likely to be covered by formal state social protection to the extent that that exists. Um, and this includes women that fall into the missing middle. So we're not always talking about women at the very bottom of the pyramid here. We're talking about women who look like us, <clears throat> but are not necessarily exercising their professional activity in a formalized structure. Um, now, what we also know is that there is a gender, globally, a gender income gap and a gender wealth gap. And I think these are also important things to look at. So even where women are using insurance, they're likely to be less well covered um, than their male counterparts purely due to affordability. They have less disposable income. And there's a really great example of this in Mexico where the government um, was concerned by this some years back and actually started looking at how well covered women were for old age, for their retirement. And Barbara can probably comment a bit more on this. She's far closer to the, the actual example than I am. But this pensions gap that exists <clears throat> is not specific to Mexico. It's just that the Mexican government has said we need to do something about this. Um, and I think it's pertinent even in our societies, here, sitting here in Luxembourg, how many women are likely to be <clears throat> excluded or um, in, a, in a difficult position once they turn 65 for a whole range of reasons, right? Um, now, I also think that there is a little bit of a fallacy around microfinance institutions and insurance, and it's, it's definitely one to address because there is this idea that all microfinance institutions offer insurance. Um, that's very far from being the case, and it's very often the case that this insurance is not necessarily meeting all the needs of, of their customers. And I think there's a real opportunity here um, with the microfinance com community, with impact investors, to take a long, hard look at how microfinance institutions could be better leveraged to serve, to provide a whole suite of financial services that really would have a lasting impact on their customers' lives beyond just returning a profit to the investors. Um, so I think 
Uh, I'll probably leave it here. I can see you're nodding your head, and um, that's the essence of what I wanted to cover. So, <laughs> oh, one last thing that I would like to call out. Sorry. Um, the good news is there are some very active um, engagements in the space, so people sitting up here with me on the panel. But also, uh, what I would like to flag is ILO's um, uh, partnership with IFC, just launching a new cohort of Making Insurance Work for Women. And if you want more information about that, please either speak to our colleague Pranav or anyone on my team, and we'll, we'll be happy to put you in touch with uh, the people running that. Okay. So insurance is facing similar challenges and solutions like other financial services. There is a business opportunity to cover, cover needs. And you mentioned Barbara, but before we want to um, go to, to Evelina, Evelina Angola is a program manager for Grameen's refugee finance program. She's a leader in community development work and has deep experience in financial inclusion, business development, VSLA methodology, digital techno technology, women and youth, entrepreneurship, financial literacy, and business skills, and linkage banking. So, Evelyn, what, what are successful approaches to financially include, especially rural women? Yeah, thank you very much, Florian. Uh, I'm really so delighted to be here today. Uh, for Grameen Foundation, we are actually uh, working closely with our, our refugees of South Sudan, supporting the refugees to organize women into savings groups. So the approach we're mainly using is the a VSLA methodology approach, where we bring a number of women into uh, savings groups to actually be able to access the savings products, but also having easy access to the loans, the micro loans that they can borrow easily. And, and start up small uh, micro businesses within themselves. But also uh, the other thing that we are actually doing is also to make sure that we link these uh, women groups into formal financial institutions so they can actually easily access uh, external credits to support their activities. And then we also try to digitize their operations. So within the local VSLA groups, we digitize their record keeping. So uh, once we do the financial linkages, the microfinance institutions that they get linked to are actually able to use their information and run the credit squarings without doing uh, you know, physical uh, appraisals for them. And, and then uh, the, the other approach uh, that we are also using is uh, making sure that we are uh, supporting most of the women to actually enroll as agents for banking. So we are, most of them actually in, onboarded as uh, mobile money agents, but also agents of different banking institutions in supporting the rural communities where they belong. Yeah. Okay, so when Thank focusing you. on rural women, VSLA, agent banking, approaches which, 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 which are uh, right to reach out to, to, to this segment. Um, Barbara, Barbara Magnoni, she's president of EA Consultants and co-founder of the FinTech Mexico and adjunct professor at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. As an international development advisor, she has advised private and public entities, including governments, international organizations, and financial institutions on the development of right-fit products and services of low-income households. I've heard that you s say that microfinance is sexist, so what, what, what do you mean by that, Barbara? Uh, I mean to provoke uh, a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> um, but I actually would like to take a, a moment, uh, take the liberty for a moment, because typically when I'm on a panel about gender at a conference that's not a gender conference, four people show up and they're women. Um, and so this is cool to have so many people in this room. So thank you all for coming to this <laughs> panel, <laughs> for caring about this topic, for being here, and obviously to the organizers for, for organizing it. Um, but I want to ask those who feel comfortable raising their hand whether they work for institutions that somehow reflect uh, the gender inequities that exist in our societies. Just raise your hand if you do. And if you don't want to raise your hand, that's OK. Four of you, that's it? OK. <laughs> I will challenge that. Um, <laughs> my point is, and thank you, Antonique, for raising your hand first. Um, <laughs> no, because it's not, I mean, it, we all live in a society that has gender inequity kind of embedded in it, whether 
we want that or not. And it could be in the places we work, it can be in the way we walk down the street, the institutions that serve us throughout our entire day in our family lives, et cetera. So why would we expect microfinance institutions to be any different, right? They are just a reflection, a mirror image of the people and the institutions that serve us. And so my point is that unless there is intentionality and an effort to change that from the perspective of gender, it won't change because that's not how change happens. It doesn't just accidentally fall in place because we happen to be serving women or have good intentions. It needs to be understood and addressed. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, I would like to share later today a little bit more uh, about some work we did this summer with an investment fund called um, Enabling Capital. I don't know if anyone is here from there. But we did a little bit of work with 12 of their investees in um, four regions around the world to try to like get at a little more of a qualitative understanding of you know, this point. Is there gender inequity baked in somehow? What are those issues, et cetera? And our high-level findings, which I'll share really briefly, reflect a lot of what's already been said. Um, the first is we've been talking about data a lot. There are a lot of sessions here about data. Data is very important. But in day-to-day -day operations, microfinance institutions typically do not use gender disaggregated data to understand what's happening or to make decisions or to develop products and services. Um, and that's still a constraint. The second thing we found, and the one that maybe um, I think is the most actionable today, is that accessibility, well, access is something that you know, we think we've got covered, right? Lots of women are <laughs> accessing financial services through microfinance and other financial inclusion institutions today. Um, there's actually some exclusion baked into that as well. What I mean by that is um, many institutions that we spoke to around the globe still require a husband to co-sign a loan. Um, it's not something that they talk about very much, but if any of you work in microfinance institutions, you probably know this quite well. And um, that means that if you don't have a husband, there might be a problem. It might be hard to do it. Or perhaps if you have a husband, but you'd rather he not be involved in that process for whatever reason. Um, and you know, we know that about a billion women and girls will be either sexually assaulted or uh, physically assaulted um, in the course of their lifetime. And so why would they need to have their husband or male family member involved in that loan process? So accessibility exists, but it's complicated still. Um, collateral is also an issue. Women own only about 20% of the land on this earth. They don't have as much collateral, and so men are often turned to to deal with that collateral. So accessibility is there, but it's not quite there, and there's more we can do. And then finally, and I think the one that gets to me the most is usage, and it's very um, linked to accessibility. But if the husband, or father in some cases, or male partner, is involved in the borrowing process, how can you ensure that he is not using that money and that the money is actually being used by a woman for her business, which is what we always talk about? Uh, there are lots of studies that say, oh, you know, 20% used it for this and 30% used it for that, but do we really know? And very few MFIs track this. And, um, you know, tracking usage is very important from a credit perspective, but it's also important to understand if you're actually doing what you're saying you're doing. But that's it for now. Thank you. So the, the monitoring aspect is very important. We, we already heard um, some challenges and some solutions to, to address women's financial needs. We now want to, to, to deepen and, and, and widen these aspects in, 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 in a discussion. So, and this goes out to, to, to all the panelists, what, what are the, the, the needs, other needs and aspirations of, of, of women regarding financial services? Anybody who wants to start? I'm happy to kick it off. So, <laughs> yes, you know, recently I went to a great session on uh, 
including women for, from an insurance perspective. And I've been reflecting on this um, a lot. It's a, of a topic that, that is a great interest to me. And uh, one of the things that struck me was, in some cases, we're talking about sort of generic products and services that any human being would benefit from having, right? Um, but women also face some very specific risks that men are far less exposed to. And one of the things that really struck me was it was an advertising campaign that was done by a South African insurer called First for Women. So they focus on women clients. Um, they pass on, for example, if it's car insurance, lower premiums because women apparently are better drivers or um, less likely to drive at night. Now, one thing you need to know about South Africa, if you don't know it, is it's a very dangerous society. So anyone living there, it's actually pretty hard to feel safe. And what really struck me, um, you know, maybe to put some numbers on that, uh, because I went and updated myself on the actual statistics, um, in, out of reported rapes, just rape, not just sort of um, assault, there's a rape every 15 minutes in South Africa, every single day of the year, right? So we're, we're not talking about something marginal here. This is a, a reality for, for women and girls who live there. And they've built this whole concept around helping their women customers to feel safe. What does it mean to feel safe? And isn't that what financial services are there to do? Um, and another, another example of that is um, an initiative in Ecuador where they've actually created a women's department staffed entirely by women and they're, they're focusing on um, insurance and, and other non-financial services to help women who are abused at home, to help them leave, provide them with counselling support, somewhere to stay, uh, help them find new jobs, training for those jobs. Um, these are, I think, some non-financial, you know, looking at what does the customer need, in this case, women customers, and then finding the solutions that match, rather than, hey, we've got the solutions, let's make square, square holes and round pegs um, work together. So, listening to women and, and also segmenting the, the, the different clients and needs. Other, other um, aspirations for, for specific groups of women, for example, from, from the clients you work with in, in, in Haiti or, or um, Uganda? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, talking about the, the needs and aspirations of especially the rural women that we directly connect up with. So we have had a lot of discussion with these women, especially at the points when we, we are setting them up to organize into smaller savings groups. So you get aspirations like uh, most of the women are actually having the desires to actually improve on their standards of living, but also looking at how best they can get into small um, businesses that can actually support them to uh, meet their family needs, but also offer better education for for their children. And these, these needs and aspirations change. You know, um, these days, one of the key concerns of, of women and men in Haiti is safety because of the, the problems with the gangs and the increased um, criminality. So finding ways for women, especially, to come to the bank and to not feel like everybody is out to, to get the money they're going to get for the bank has become increasingly a problem for all financial service providers in Haiti and for Foncose too. So sending credit agents out instead of having the, the people come to the branch is one of the things we do more and more to, to help address that problem. Okay. A few years ago, we we felt we needed to put more of a, a deliberate framework around what we meant when we said empowerment and then that financial products and services or the engagement with a financial product or service empowered a woman. And, and so we worked, we were fortunate to work with Martha Chan, many of you may have known her to sort of update a framework she designed for USAID very, very, very early on in the microfinance days to track the kinds of changes that a woman goes through and experiences in her life by virtue of being um, engaged with financial services. And, and so the, the first two are kind of easy ones. Um, is there a material change in her life? Is there 
does she have more assets? Is there more income coming in, in, into the household? The second is a, a cognitive change. Did she gain greater awareness? Did she gain a cognitive skill or knowledge or um, gain, as I say, greater awareness of something that she may have access to? Um, the third one I think is, is um, we've, we've touched on and I, I think is very often one of the most interesting, it's relational change. Does she have more decision-making power um, in her household as a result of having greater control perhaps of financial services? There's some really interesting data that's showing women that, that do have that kind of control are more likely to vote and potentially more likely to run for, for political office. And, uh, for the researchers in the room, I would absolutely encourage you to make this a, a research topic. Um, I think we all have a lot of um, sort of instinctive judgment about the linkage between financial safety and, and physical safety, but there is not the seminal research paper that clearly says that there is indeed a linkage. Um, so I really encourage that to happen. Um, and then the last change is, um, it, again, is around something we've, we've talked about, is that woman, does she have greater self-esteem? Is she able to plan for the future? Is she thinking beyond just that day-to-day -day existence? Is she thinking about her, is she, is she able to control her own sort of physical circumstances and physical, physical safety? And so I think that might be a, a way of thinking about um, you know, you, I thought it was lovely that you used the word aspiration, the way women uh, might aspire to um, what can be achieved through inclusion. Yeah. Okay. Can, I, can I add something to that? Because I think that's right, the sort of autonomy and agency piece is so important and can be generalized. And sometimes um, what I've found is that institutions want to segment in these kind of categories and say, you know, uh, housing loans and education and you know these are sort of the things that women want and we did some research with an MFI to try to figure that out and it was so interesting because um, if you're trying to measure and this kind of goes back to the old like Esther Duflo you know microfinance doesn't have an impact stuff um, <laughs> but you know if you're trying to take averages right and say oh you know education hasn't increased on average well that's okay but why and so we, we went to an MFI and we started interviewing a bunch of clients and what we found, and most of them were women, um, but what we found was, and this is sort of obvious, so maybe what we found is the wrong way to say it, but everybody wants different things, right? So I always compare these two households I went to. One was a very nice um, house where a woman had recently put in a cement floor and she was talking about how when the floor was, this is in Nicaragua, by the way, but. Um, when the floor was dusty, um, cleaning it and sweeping it created a lot of dust. There were health issues in the house. It was hard to keep the kids healthy, and so it was really important to her to pay for the cement floor, which is great and super valuable to her. Um, another household you know, nearby, uh, we went in, and it was the opposite. It was kind of falling apart. Everything was kind of hanging off of you know, different pieces of wood that were barely uh, held together. Uh, and their kids are in college. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and that family did not prioritize housing. The housing was kind of a disaster. Um, but they prioritized education. And they had these two girls who were in college. Um, and so it's really hard to generalize, right? It's uh, autonomy, though, and, and kind of the... Um, the power to make those choices and the financial instruments to facilitate that is what we're looking for. It's not necessarily kind of these little product silos. Okay, so security safety is, is, is a basis and then it's autonomy, empowerment, and financial well-being of the woman but also of, of, of the family. And we heard about some, some, some barriers, but can you elaborate a bit more on, on barriers and also identify some root causes of, of women's financial exclusion? Well, who wants to start? <laughs> 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 okay, start. let's start with something really simple. Um, uh, opening hours. Yes. Um, Women working, um, often doing unpaid work, so doing two or three jobs between what is uh, money earning uh, plus 
looking after home children, parents, whatever it is, finding time to go to an agency only to find that it is closed when she's able to go, or who's going to look after the kids. I heard a great example yesterday of um, an institution that had basically changed their opening hours and also provided childcare facilities or allowed the the woman allowed, I mean, to me, I was amazed that this was even a question to bring the kids along with her, right? Um, so I think those are, are two barriers. I think another barrier can be the cost of, we talk a lot about digitalization. Uh, digitalization is great, it's necessary, it can be an accelerator, but in many instances, it also can, unless it's managed carefully, exclude women unintentionally. Why? because not all women have got access to smartphone, tablet, um, even feature phone. Data can be expensive. Coverage is not necessarily great. And, and most of all, I think, you know, it comes back to looking at things holistically. If the cost of data bundles is super high and the only way we're going to be including women is if they can access that on, on some kind of internet requiring um, phone or tablet, it's automatically excluding them. And it's, it's not just about the technology or how stupid women are because they're so stupid they can't figure out how to work a, a smartphone. I don't buy that. I think that is an, a nonsense. And I often think that this thing that women are somehow less financially literate than men, um, I don't agree. I think women manage the budget of their households and families. They are incredibly aware of the the value of money and the value of time because most women are incredibly financially constrained and time constrained. Uh, and it, I think it's time we stopped thinking that everyone has to have a doctorate in maths to understand how to manage their, their household budget because it's simply not true. I'd really love to just double down on the technology point because um, as, as we all move to the understanding that digital financial services are the way we are going to reach excluded populations, to then not have the technology in, in women's hands becomes an even more urgent issue. Um, we made great progress in the, the year 2020 in terms of narrowing the gender gap particularly with smartphone access. But in the two years that the GSMA has been tracking the data, we've seen the gap widen again, and we're back up to 18% gender gap between um, men's and women's ownership of, um, of internet-enabled um, technology. So getting the, the technology in, into the women's hands, and, I, and I'm so glad you mentioned the cost of data. I mean, it's, it's, it's exorbitant. Um, I had a fascinating conversation with um, Mats Granrid, the Director General of the GSMA, when he was in New York for, um, for the UNGA, and I think it was, he, he shared one of the most amazing statistics with me that I saw as kind of a, you know, the shape of things to come for those of us in financial inclusion. Um, he said that there were only 450 million people who lived in a place that didn't have internet coverage at all, which 450 million people is a lot of people, but it's still come way, way down. But there are 3.2 billion people who are in a place that is covered by internet, that have access to internet coverage, that are not using it. So I think that, that coming back around to making the, the products and services relevant making sure that, that people are comfortable using them, that they, there's a level of trust with financial service providers. Um, and I think the trust conversation, I'd love to hear um, some of the panelists talk about that because it is such an enormous issue for women, feeling that you know, banks are not for us, microfinance isn't for us. Um, but I, I do think that there's, um, we, we have a pretty good idea how to get women into the system, and I know I'm repeating myself, but now we just have to really focus on keeping them there. So it's, it's the, the availability of technology, the cost. Before you mentioned skills, so it's also about uh, digital and financial literacy. Other barriers you encounter when, in, in your daily work? Yeah, just uh, picking up from uh, the barrier around digital financial literacy. So especially for the rural women, there is also a challenge of the network. Of course, we have tried to uh, 
do a lot more education on digital financial literacy with the rural groups that we work with. But also, we, we still, um, they, they still meet this challenge of uh, network access to actually be able to use the digital financial services or even access those existing the digital financial services. But the other key um, challenge has also been um, accessibility, especially to these form of financial institutions that are offering uh, a lot of financial services to them. That has still been a big issue, especially in the rural areas. I, I really hate to say this, but sometimes it's our own staff that is the barrier also. Oh. Because you have to work with them to, to work on their mindsets. They have their, like you were saying, Barbara, they have their own cultural biases regarding gender. They also have biases related to the fact that they're educated and very often the people they work with are not formally educated. They work for a formal institution. The people they work with do not. And so that creates all kinds of, of kind of power imbalances that can be really be a barrier to inclusion if you don't work with your staff to change those mindsets. And and what about, for example, con consumer protection? We heard DFS are, are, are one 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 key, but we also hear a lot about fraud and scams. And then, of course, also the need to have uh, female agents to to, to better address and reach out to women customers. Do, do, you, do you experience that as well? Mm -hmm. We actually really have to go out and, and make a special effort to recruit female field staff. And it was really interesting because when we started to, to do this exercise, we started by talking to the women who were already part of our staff to try and, under, and understand what the difficulties were and why some of their colleagues weren't interested in coming to work for Foncose. And one of the key problems was the, the first line managers, most of them are men, and they would go around and tell candidates, like, oh, no, if you are a microfinance agent, you can't get pregnant. Because if you're pregnant, you can't drive a motorcycle, so you have to stop working for nine months. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you have those ideas walking around, there's actually a barrier to recruiting female agents. So it's important, again, to listen to the people and to understand and identify these kind of barriers. It's easier to first identify your own barriers because those are easier to work on, too. And um, that some of them are really unexpected. Okay. Can I jump off from that for a second? Um, so we did a study in Latin America with Andares, which is a network of uh, women professionals in the Spanish-speaking world in microfinance. Um, we interviewed 146 MFIs in the region and found an enormous um, disparity between sort of frontline staff, which tends to be very female-oriented and sort of management, right? There was a pyramid. So 50% of staff are um, women at the, at the bottom, but as you go up, it becomes closer to 20, 30, depending on the country. Um, and that kind of imbalance, we call it starting at home. If you don't believe internally that women are worth hiring and promoting, then why are you supporting women in your service, how can they be your clients and how can you be offering them that respect and, and that trust uh, institutionally if you don't have it internally? So we talk about starting internally and starting at home um, from that. And, and a, a key barrier there that I want to emphasize, given who's in the room, is political will. Um, Foncose has it. They care. They are interested in figuring it out and challenging themselves and their staff and working on it. But many institutions don't. And working with the institutions that don't is very, very difficult. Um, and I have some thoughts about how to change it. It's not perfect. But without the political will, all those other barriers that we see just don't get addressed. Or they get addressed like one off, you know, like one little product or one little change. But you don't have that kind of internalization mm -hmm. that is necessary to really move the needle. 
And the, the statement that microfinance is sexist, you said you wanted to, to, to provoke, but I, I guess <laughs> it's also about <laughs> um, so, social norms, which, exactly. which you wanted to hinder. Well, which we live in a patriarchal society, mm. right? And uh, different countries exhibit that differently. Um, but they, the staff and the management and the investors internalize, and the donors, I mean, everyone, right? They internalize those norms and then they feed through into the services. And so without kind of intentionally changing that, you're still going to see it feeding through. I don't know if we're all in agreement I, I, here on this. Yeah, I, I'd like to, I'll, <laughs> I'll pick up on that a little bit. So yeah. for, for many years, um, I've been interested in, uh, you know, this whole discussion about women on boards, yeah. right? I mean, when I say I've been interested in it for a long time, I've been interested in it for about 20 years because I'm very, very old. Um, and, <laughs> right, um, right there with you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, one thing that really struck me uh, in the research, you know, there's quite a lot of uh, practical research that is now available in analysis. And there's this one figure that always sticks in my mind is that there's no point having a woman on a board. You need to have at least three. Now, why is that? The reason for that is if what you're wanting to... If you're wanting to encourage inclusion you need to allow for diversity. And I don't mean uh, some kind of paint washing. What I mean is you have to actually create a space for different points of view and for, for people who might find it quite difficult and threatening to express what they really think, whatever that is, to express it. So it's a, a different kind of safety. It's a concept called psychological safety. How do you make it possible for people who disagree with you, um, and I can tell you, people find it quite hard to disagree with me because I can be quite forceful in my opinions, and one of my personal challenges speaking about uh, integrating has, has been trying to learn to give other people that space to put their different point of view, even though I might not agree with it. It might change the way I think. So how do you create that for... Um, for women, for, for clients, uh, going beyond just having token women in management or sitting on boards, actually allowing enough time for different ideas to come to the surface and be appropriated and integrated and, and implemented. Um, and that's as subtle as tone of voice, you know? Yeah. It's, it's so subtle that we don't think about it, but it's in everything. Um, so, so you already hinted at some of the, the, the approaches and, and, and solutions. Um, what, what other actions should, should be taken to, to, to tackle the barriers and, and the root causes of...? Well, what I would really like to see happening is, is actually more customer insight work. I mean, I think that if there's one thing that is critically needed, it's actually to go and do this kind of listening uh, you know, it's in what kind of way, shape, or form does that have to be very expensive? Probably not, but uh, collective action to understand from women clients what, it, what are their different needs, barriers, without framing it as um, do you ever buy insurance or are you saving for retirement? You know, let's start with what is the woman's customer journey? Now, my guess is that a lot of that material actually exists in a different guise. But um, I know, you know, in collaboration with some of our members, including Women's World Banking, but also others, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at how could we actually get some of this information because you're not going to get it from a very quantitative study like Global Findex. It, it requires more qualitative work um, so that we can come up with a better understanding and evolve that because things are not static and learn lessons that can be cross-shared across countries, right? So women in one country are not all the same, and there might be similarities in women's segments in different countries, so you could cross-learn. And I would love to see that kind of work um, being backed and, and being really robust and, and taking forward this, this cause, if you like. You mentioned women-centered design. Can you elaborate a bit more in this regard? Well, I think it's it's very um, very akin to what, what Catherine was just um, was just referring to is just really listening to the the needs and the I think I think almost as important 
important as the needs, sort of the, the pain points or the problems or what is the, the distance that, or the, what, what's keeping the woman from interacting with, with a product? We see so often it, it, it is this sort of emotional distance that women don't see a bank being for them or thinking that the small amount of savings that they have to make, even if they're going to be able to do it quite frequently, but it's a small amount, they don't think that that's quote unquote worthy um, of, of a bank. So sort of hearing that, you can then tailor your product or what we see so often is the products are actually maybe not in need of tailoring as much as the marketing and the way that they are, the way they're sold, the way they're described. Um, we talked a bit about women agents might be you know, better able. There's so much evidence that peer, peer training, peer learning is the best way of, of imparting financial literacy lessons? Is it also perhaps a way of onboarding um, clients to a, to a product? It's a story I tell a lot. So people in the audience may have heard this already, but we did some work with a mobile network operator in Pakistan that um, was very committed to making sure that their digital wallet was actually reaching women. That was something they very much wanted to do. I think it was to some of the point we've made here because they had a, a female chief technology officer and it was really important to her. Um, but even after their best efforts, they only had 12% women clients using, uh, using the product. She managed to get the CEO to um, spend some money on what she thought they needed, which was a woman's product. But when, and they brought Women's World Banking in to help design it, when we looked at the data, those 12% women were using the products that the men were exactly the way the men were. But the big differential was their onboarding process um, really didn't work for women. There were 97% of their agents were, um, male-owned shopkeepers or ma male shops. So if that intrepid Pakistani woman was going to go into that shop, that was gonna be pretty daunting. And once she got in there, she then had to give the man her cell phone number, which none of the men in her household were very happy about. And so it was really keeping women, uh, you know, distancing women, women from that product. So we worked with, um, with the MNO, with, um, uh, Unilever that had a nationwide network of women, um, uh, women kiosk owners. We trained them in becoming uh, banking agents, and I mean this was extraordinary. We don't not not every women's world banking um, product introduction has this kind of uh, uh, history, but literally within a matter of months, they had gotten to 42 percent women clients from 12 percent just by having that distribution channel be a, a friendlier one in, in, in an easier one for them to access in that cultural context. Another thing, if you want some more provocation, is um, <laughs> <laughs> if the Indian microfinance market were to figure out how to make loans to men, it would be very helpful to the women they're currently lending to. And uh, there's a lot of people who receive loans and a lot of men who don't receive loans by Indian microfinance institutions. Because if you're funneling money through a woman to her husband, you're not really helping her. Um, but the reason they do it is because it's a risk management strategy. They get the groups. It's cost effective. You know, there are, there are a lot of reasons why lending through the woman, using the woman as a vehicle, makes sense. Um, but, but what if you could actually put your heads together and think, hmm, if what the guy needs is a motorcycle, why don't we make a loan to him for a motorcycle <laughs> and leave her out of it? Um, that would be really cool for all of those here who work in India. I think there's, a, there's, there's another element you could bring into this, which is a bit of a, it's more of a psychosocial element, right? So not all women are mothers, but many women are mothers. And one of the hardest things as a mother is when you have your, your kids coming to you 
they need something, um, and it's very difficult to say no. And I think a lot of women get put in the, the situation where maybe they've started a business or they've got a job and they're busy mm. trying to put money aside for something, maybe something necessary, maybe just one of their own projects. One of their kids, small, adolescent, older, comes to them with a problem. Uh, I'm not going to take a poll, but ask yourselves inside, how easy is it to say no? And then your plans just are smashed again. Um, Taylor and Swift tickets just came out. <laughs> For example, yeah. I mean, you know, and, and sometimes it's more dramatic things, but it is very, very difficult. And giving women the courage and power to, to set those boundaries without being made to feel like they're lousy mothers, I think would also actually go a long way to empowering women and, and securing Absolutely. their sort of financial health and wealth. And, and from the, the, the institutions uh, you, you, you work with or you, you advise, what, what are concrete um, approaches or, or actions and how do they translate into the provision of financial or non-financial services to, to reach out to women? Yeah, so for, uh, for the case of Uganda, we, we kind of see a lot of financial institutions getting into collaboration with the NGOs especially to be able to reach out to the rural women. As we all know that most of the women find it so challenging to directly contact the financial institutions. So some of these uh, leveraging collaborations together has actually helped uh, uh, the women get linked to some financial institutions. Yeah. And uh, the other thing, uh, she talked about having tailored products. Of course, uh, some of the financial institutions in Uganda have designed products that are mainly tailored for the rural women. I'm talking about um, the refugees in particular, where some uh, financial institutions have taken initiatives to have products that are tailor needs, uh, meeting the needs of particularly the refugees, and they find it very comfortable having some of those, or accessing some of those products. Um, for us, I think, the more female staff you have interacting with clients and managing at the first management level, how, how, um, how more you become accessible to women. And um, from that point of view, in, in Haiti, we learned that one of the barriers to, for, for women, young women, to become our employees was just the image they had of themselves being an employee. You know, they, in, in their minds, a professional woman is a woman with high, heels that high and a nice little, you know, short skirt and having a jeans and boots and on a motorcycle definitely doesn't fit the image. And so having our women talk to young students and explain to them, I'm, I'm a woman and I feel good in this job for this and that and that reason, I think that's also some of the things you address the internal barriers to, to recruiting more female staff. And, and what, what non-financial services are important? I mean, you mentioned capacity building for women clients. Um, what, what, what examples do you see which, which are really important? And so one of the things that we've picked up um, in, in, in our research and also the, the case studies that we follow is um, you know, it can be things like health screenings, offering health screening as part of the service, uh, you know, whether that's linked to insurance or not, um, early warning signals, because let's face it, if you are a woman and you're working, one of the things I speak from my personal experience when my children were still dependent on me was what happens if I get sick? What happens if I die? What happens if I can't see them through until they're independent and autonomous, right? I think every parent has this worry maybe to a greater or lesser extent depending on, on their situation. And so I think offering, offering services that are actually going to help the women <coughs> feel more confident, less anxious, and actually then better able to be a productive member of society in, 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 the, in all senses is... Um, is a way to go, and I think, you know, there are others where there are offering um, training, uh, how to run your business better, uh, and I think often these offerings are more tangible for women than, than the financial services themselves, right? 
Mm -hmm. uh, apart from loans, where obviously you're getting money, so that's good. Before opening uh, up to, to, to all the participants, um, maybe one last statement from everybody from you. What, what, what headline about women's financial inclusion would you like to read in, let's say, 2030? I hesitate to say no gender gap because I think the gender gap, at least as the FINDEX measures it, is really so imperfect. Um, but yeah, I guess that there is no, there, that women are genuinely included. Um, there is no gender gap because women are genuinely included. Not much of a headline, I don't know. <laughs> it's difficult to put it into one headline, but. It's maybe the fact that when, when a woman wants a financial product, she can find it. She doesn't have to look too far, make too much effort. She just can find it if she wants to. She can find it. She can afford it. She, can, um, she is not endangered by using it. Uh, that, and, uh, and she can prosper. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I like that. So I, I, I actually, I, I thought about this headline. <laughs> I, I, I took it quite seriously and I went home last night and I thought, yeah, let me have a look again. What are the actual targets under um, SDG 5? Um, and I actually, I, I thought that they might have been slightly ambitious with the sustainable development goals because mm. achieving gender <laughs> equality slightly. by 2030, even sitting in 2015, I thought, yeah, um, Nice idea, but, um, and I think the one thing that we could aspire towards would be to have some kind of global shield such as just being launched for, for the impact of climate change on vulnerable countries and vulnerable populations. You know, why, why wouldn't there be a global shield, for example, to compensate for women, unpaid work in the home? Mm. You know, there's a very tangible... Uh, practical thing that can be addressed as being addressed in some countries to a greater or lesser extent through redistribution or tax systems. Why not just have that very specific goal? You know, what would that then look like in terms of empowering women and girls? Yeah, maybe rather than a headline, I would like to see um, at least the same number of women managing the sector as men, um, both in terms of CEOs as well as on boards um, and investors, people. <laughs> yeah, in terms of the headline, I would say would like to see the rural women at some move to some level in financial inclusion. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much for for this headline. Let's let's uh, see what what we can read. And now it's, it's, it's your turn um, to, to ask questions, and, and, and please really do ask questions. Try, try to frame it in one or two phrases and, and, and not too many statements. Oh. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, there, there are facilitators working around with microphones, so let's collect maybe two, three questions. And please uh, present yourself quickly with your, with your name and the institutions you're working Thank for. you very much. My name is Anthony Koning. I was the person shamelessly uh, called out <laughs> for what I hope you all understood was the right reason. So thanks for that. Um, I, I love the discussions. I think there's a lot of very good points made. Um, I have a question specifically to you, Karine. I would love to hear how you help changing mindsets within your organization. And then maybe, Barbara, you can talk a little bit about that from what you've seen work well, because I think it is one of the critical pieces. And you've referred to um, the workforce. I, another shameless plot here for the next session after this, where Finequity actually works with Oiko Credit on uh, gender diversity and uh, the gender balanced workforce. So I invite all of you who want to learn more about that to come uh, to that. But um, I leave you with the question. Thank you. 
I join you in, in saying how fantastic this session was. I'm completely invigorated. Thank you also for the amazing uh, question at the end. I'm Carmen Nietema with the European Investment Bank. We are located here in Luxembourg. And my question to the panel is, if you had a magic wand and you have had all the money that you can possibly have, how would you employ it today for larger impact on women's access to finance in the future? Like, what is it that I could ask the universe to actually put in place today? Because we know a lot what is working, but where have you been trying to go and you just haven't gotten there yet because it's money or it's knowledge or what is it that we can actually grab as the next thing? Thank you. It's, it's EIB who is asking the questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so who wants to start? Well, we have the magic wand and then yeah. there are specific questions for yeah. Karen. Yeah, Karen should. <laughs> Okay, so how I changed the mindset within Foncosé. Now, I'm actually really very fortunate because my, my colleague who manages Foncosé's microfinance institution is a woman, and both of us in our senior management team, we actually have gender parity. So from that point of view, um, we are fortunate. We've been able to recruit good women to help us in leadership. And I think it's, it's like Barbara was saying, it's a question of political will. You have to make it your priority. And so it comes through whenever you talk. You talk about it. And then your colleagues go, whoa, not that again. <laughs> but that's what it needs, I think. You have to get back to it again and again and again and make sure you embed it in the systems, in the human resources, in the program monitoring and evaluation, in the management team discussions, it has to get back and back and back again. One of the, the risks, and that's, I'm, I'm talking specifically with Foncosé, it's that idea that as long as you serve prior, in priority women clients, you're okay. Which of course we all know is not true. Because it's not because you serve women clients that you really serve them the way they should be served. So that's also something that we have to keep in mind. It's not because 98% of our credit clients are women that we're okay with gender and we don't have to pay any attention to it anymore. Yeah, and just to bounce off of that, last night somebody asked me this question and they said, well, Maybelline serves pretty much only women clients right now, though they're trying to get into the men's market. And we're not all giving them public funds, are we? <laughs> they're doing it for a different reason and in a different way. Um, and so, yeah, I think just to piggyback off of that and what I've seen on political will, um, you know, I've, I've interviewed different people who have been pushing this internally. And there's um, a man who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago who was on the board of a, a large MFI in Bolivia. And prior to that, spearheaded a big institution, um, a SME department and a big institution, and really charged like a women-centered, women-focused management team um, in that institution and tried to kind of replicate that in Bolivia. And what he said is, um, you, you need to get at least some people on board and make everybody else ashamed to voice their opinion <laughs> because they're now in the minority, because there's some people you will never change. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was really helpful because we sometimes bang our heads against the walls trying to change everybody's mind, and we can't. Um, and, and so that's one piece. I think the second piece is even though I feel very, very strongly that gender equity is fair and important and something we should all put on our radar. Sometimes it's easier to frame these issues as equity in general. And when I've done trainings on this, we fall into that, whether I want it or not, because the audience isn't always ready. But when we talk about equity, socioeconomic, racial, ethnic, in a broader way, everybody starts to feel a little bit of themselves touched mm -hmm. and responds and starts to act more inclusive. And so sometimes we can have a gender agenda without putting that you know, front and center 
in every conversation in order to get more people to get involved in the conversation and to buy in. And then finally, to your point, I don't have an answer, but what I will say is I think we have to be careful about top-down, very sort of colonial approaches to this because the bottom-up stuff is so rich and important and building uh, cohesion from the loan officers, the clients, the middle managers, all the way up is so important that just focusing on that top and just kind of pushing down is probably not gonna give us the richness of results that we want without being inclusive and really thinking about solutions that are more grassroots and really involve the most people that we can possibly solve. I know that doesn't really answer your question, but it's a starting point. Uh, yeah. The magic wand, who wants to comment? I, I would get a internet-enabled phone and data package into every woman's hand and um, the capability and confidence to, to use it and navigate, um, navigate the digital financial services. I like that. Um, <laughs> but as well as that, because you've got a wand and I've got a wand, right? Yeah. So yeah, there's five wands here. Yeah. Um, I think that um, decent education, and I'm going to define a little what I mean by that, for all children, but especially girls who are more likely to drop out of school, um, I think this is absolutely crucial. And I mean the kind of education that teaches them to think for themselves so that they know how to, what questions to ask to find the answers they need on these um, devices that their mothers will then have. Um, I think that is absolutely critical. Education that builds problem-solving skills, self-confidence, um, because this is survival, right? Um, and not necessarily the kind of education that might happen in many schools today, which is about, you know, rote learning. I'm talking about education that is focused on problem solving, building that self-confidence that is what you need to take you to wherever you need to go. And the internet, of course. Yeah, I think I'm in agreement with education. That's really what I saw, uh, especially also for the rural poor. We wouldn't look at uh, probably money as a big aspect, but mindset change and a lot of sensitization <coughs> would work best. Um, there's different kinds of magical ones, I would say. You know, it would be great to have a magical one that changes people's mindset. That's quite a bit more complicated. If it's a, a money kind of digital one, of, of magical one, I would, I would say as, as a microfinance institution, we would really like to, to offer our clients a lot of training and about stuff that really is important to their day-to-day -day lives. But most of the time, given the margins that we have in a country like Haiti, we just can't afford it. So having more resources to actually train more and give people more access to quality information that really makes a difference in their lives, I'd love a magical one like that. <laughs> so before uh, taking more questions here from the room, I'm wondering if we have uh, any, any, any questions from our virtual participants. We thought it'd be best if I just read them out yes. to you and you can pick and choose. Uh, there are several. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So Noella, who's a student, says, it is often said that a woman's place is in the kitchen, but with financial inclusion, most of them have become great leaders and financially independent. But my problem is why do most of these women today still suffer from male subordination? That can go to whoever. <clears throat> and I'll give you another one now as well. It's from Mika. I admire the strategy of some MFIs, for example, CARD in the Philippines, of hiring young adult children, often female, of MFI members and clients as field staff who then move up the ranks, who understand the value of serving women like their mothers. Are there other examples of this? Are there obstacles that prevent more of this? And is this something that can be further promoted? Have a go with those first? Yes, yes, thank you. So. 
why do women suffer from male subordination? <laughs> <laughs> How long have we got? Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> you, you have to answer it maybe even less than a minute, if possible. Well, I think it's unfair to ask that question to this panel because it is a bigger mm, question. But within the context of our sector, maybe, we, <laughs> we might be able to, to speak a little more specifically, right? Um, you, you know, and I, I'm not sure if I was talking to some of the leaders of our clients in Haiti, whether they would <laughs> recognize themselves in the idea of male Please. subordination. Mm. Absolutely mm. not. You know, just because through their loans they have been able to develop their own revenue streams and their own economic activities and a lot of agency, um, they certainly don't see themselves as being subordinated to the males in their family. Mm. I'm talking to, about yeah, Haiti no, now. I'm really, yeah, I, mm. I know the question was mm. asked, but it just always irks me that you know that that you're asking women to answer the why question that that just doesn't that just never sits well with me but also uh, th this industry is never going to move forward if we continue to think about charity cases and victims and subordination mm -hmm. it's not that it, it, it isn't we've mm -hmm. all worked with extraordinarily strong women mm -hmm. who don't mm -hmm. think of themselves that way yeah. so. So let's, let's focus on the solutions and the second question. It was about other examples. Well, there are a couple more, but there was the one of other examples of uh, MFIs hiring young adult children, female, as to sort of be mentored by their mothers. Uh, there's another interesting one as well. Perhaps you could choose which you uh, want to take. When we talk about gender, there are, this is from Maria Zambrano. When we talk about gender, there are other criteria of vulnerability that make some women hard to reach. Disabled people are usually the forgotten ones. What will be your thoughts on intersectionality for financial inclusion? Thank you. So maybe the, the first question about hiring. Mm -hmm. Evelyn, Karen. In, in, with Foncose, it happens. It's not that it's a, it's a deliberate strategy, but because we hire our staff also based on references and that some of the references are from clients, it regularly happens that we have staff whose mothers were our clients. The, the guy who currently heads our, he, our, our health program is a, a doctor who was actually the son of a microfinance client 20 years ago. On the second question, um, we were, we've been supporting a project which is experimental in Mexico um, that is a, a climate insurance project for very small farmers. And we were asked to kind of help with the inclusion piece of it to make sure that um, everybody's enrolled, including women, including disabled, including elderly, just kind of everybody who is eligible will be enrolled. Um, and the process that um, was developed was a very costly one with uh, group meetings, explaining the product, and then um, everybody who didn't come to a group meeting was visited by a, an outreach uh, person to, to try to kind of bring them in and explain the product and enroll them in their own homes. Um, and this was sort of at the pilot level, but what we're starting to see is that there are some ways to cover some people either digitally or in groups or ways that are kind of more cost effective, but that the marginal additional people that we want to include may cost a bit more. And that's a political decision that we need to make when we're doing outreach, right? Um, we, don't all, we can't always assume the same levels of efficiency for every single client to be completely inclusive. Um, but if we design for those very excluded people and kind of do that to everybody, it becomes quite costly. Um, so kind of mixing can be useful. Another round of questions here from, from the room. I see the one, two. Yeah, please. Um, you. Thank you for this great discussion. I really enjoyed it. My name is Sahana Arun Kumar, and I'm a consultant with Amarante Consulting. Um, 
I know you said it's not fair, but I'll try again in a different way. <laughs> um, or maybe just ask if you have examples of, you know, grassroots education that does not only look at classroom education, but actually from a from a community and a, you know cultural point of view, where we can then sensitize families as a whole, uh, maybe leaders of communities as a whole, and then bring, you know, a bit more from a community perspective on how we can, you know get a bit more of an equal footing because if it's only in the classroom or if it's only changing mindset in a workplace mm. you know you go back home as a wife or, or child and you're back into a setting that very could be very removed um, but again if there are examples or initiatives you know I know there are a lot of development you know actors in the room it'd be great to hear a bit more of what we can do to change at the grassroots thank you I, and there is uh, maybe we take one more question um, there was can you please go to the Mr. Here? Yeah. Hello. Am I audible? Okay. So uh, I completely agree. So my name is Piyush. I represent Grameen Foundation India. So uh, completely agree with your thoughts that for exclusion, you do not need a, maybe a bigger change. Even smaller changes makes a difference. I'll just narrate one of the incidents where. Uh, what happens, for example, if a woman is going to a bank branch, right, just to fill up a form, made to open a bank account or to withdraw money. But if there's a, if there's a branch manager who is trying to help her, even without uh, any uh, bad intention, just holds her hand to fill up the form, that's where the exclusion starts, right? Uh, th that lady will never go to the bank branch again to open question. a bank account, right? It's as simple as that. Uh, so do you think that where uh, profits are important, what we started off as microfinance, has now become more commercialized. People are moving towards more commercial aspects of it, making profits. So uh, even if you look at the staffs at the ground or at the uh, mobile money agents, they get trained on products. But they never get trained on how to talk to a women agent, how to talk to a women customer, how to deal with them, right? And even the smaller aspects, like I narrated, just by holding a hand, you have excluded a, a lady and also the group itself from the financial services. So whatever political will you have, whatever processes you have, she will never, she is never going to come back Please to. Please get, get, get to the question. Yeah, so my question is that how can we kind of uh, sensitize uh, 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 these agents and staffs on the ground? Should we also have a training more on the behavioral aspect and also along with the products? So is that a solution? I'm just asking. I mean, I think Thank for you. sure, one thing in India though that um, I think is a real problem is that the loan officers sleep in the branch and therefore they have to all be guys because they're all sleeping in the same room. Um, and <laughs> that makes it really difficult um, to hire female loan officers that can be very effective in bridging that gap. Um, I was in an experimental all-female branch once, and I think that should be replicated profusely um, because uh, that would help kind of balance things out and also learn a lot from those interactions that can then be taught to um, the, the men who are loan officers in the field. Um, I don't know, those are my two cents on, on that. And the examples of grassroots education? Um, we're actually working now with um, Fundacion Capital. They're based, based in Colombia. Um, they've developed a, a training product that is actually half game, half training, and it's on a tablet. And the, the, the methodology is that you allow your clients to go home with the tablet for a couple of days. And we, we see that working really well because women can take the tablet home, use it when they want to, at the times that best fit their own agenda. And also we see that they share the tablet with their families, with their kids, with their husbands. And so it's, it's, it actually starts um, a discussion around a little game or a story. Um, when we introduced the product, uh, our board was like, Woo, what are you doing? Giving tablets to these people, well, that is going to cost a, a ton of money. We're going to lose a ton of tablets. <laughs> But actually, of course, we didn't. It, it works really well, and the women love it, because for, a lot of, for many of them, it's actually the first time they touch a tablet. You see, so there's, there's part of it is digital education, 
and part of it is about the content and about sharing it with family. So I think um, we, we, we can uh, try to conclude, and I think summing up, it has become obvious that um, financial inclusion of women goes way beyond outreach. It's, it's linked to autonomy, safety, empowerment, opportunities, and overcoming social norms uh, that, that, that drive inequality, and that we need a holistic and an intentional approach, and that it's important to address both demand and supply side barriers, ideally in one program. And we should use women-centric design models. And that women needs are diverse, so we should listen what women want from money and, and, and ask them how they want to use it. And even better understand their, their, their aspirations and needs and, and, and try to segment the women clientele. And it's important to meet women's financial needs through financial and non-financial services. And financial services providers need to promote gender mainstreaming across their products and services, but also within the institution. And I think tonight at the award ceremony and also in, in, in the publication, you will find many good examples. And now finally the, the time has come to an end, but um, there are many more interesting sessions about um, 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 women's uh, financial in, uh, policy and, and regulatory in, in, uh, innovations about the role of agents and gender lens investment and gender diversity and leadership. So please um, go out, collect this information and connect with each other to, to further advance women's financial inclusion. So thank you very much and please um, put your hands together for the wonderful panelists. Mm -hmm.